Let's get into it. Soul Not For Sale podcast. We got Joe Rogan and Sam Morell talking about Jon Stewart and his return to The Daily Show. And I springboarded that conversation into the war between Tucker Carlson and Jon Stewart. Now, maybe you don't know. Maybe you think you know what I mean. That clip from the 90s. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that. We're going to see some of that because I want you to see the stuff that they don't show you because in that interaction, they always say Tucker Carlson got destroyed, but I don't think so. I'm going to show you some stuff, but Tucker Carlson actually responds. If you don't know, recently, Jon Stewart made a pretty much an expose, just slamming Tucker for the fact that he would even think to interview Putin as most of the mainstream media did. Tucker Carlson was on Lex Friedman recently, and he decided that he was going to respond to what Jon Stewart had to say. So I'm going to be showing you about 13 different clips if we include Joe right now. We're going to be touching on Crossfire, then Tucker Carlson responding to it a few years later, then uh, Jon Stewart's attack on Tucker Carlson, then Tucker Carlson responding to who Jon Stewart is in general with Jimmy Dore, then Tucker Carlson responding to Jon Stewart via Lex Friedman. There's a whole lot going in this. Tucker Carlson slams him pretty hard, and he should. I have some things to say about Jon Stewart. I don't propagandist. That's where I'm going to start it at. And I know some of you will be like, no, no, he's just funny. He's just a comedian. I will explain throughout the episode. Don't forget about IamCoachColin.com. We got different variations of Soul Not For Sale. We got a whole bunch of stuff. Public Enemy number one, anti-mainstream stuff, We The People stuff, presidential mugshots, certified purebloods, all sorts of stuff. Discount code is IamCoachColin, all capital letters, all one word, one L in the name Colin. Let's start with Rogan. And so then I listened, I ordered the whole album on iTunes and I listened to the whole thing on the way home. It's so it's cool. Like, it's incredible. I love it. By the way, I love when it's on shuffle and you hear like, it goes from like a Tom Waits song to like Nick DiPaolo and you're like, that was fucking, <laughs> that was a big right turn right there. Holy shit. I no, think it's a steaming pile of me. I think that's yes. the one that I downloaded. That's one. That, fucking, he was good, man. He was excellent. And uh, I think it's important to make fun of both sides. And that's, I, 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 it makes me sad to see people get mad at Jon Stewart right now for, for shitting on both sides. I think it's, he's a comedian first. And I think it's cool to, when you go to the clubs, they don't know exactly what you're going to say. Yeah, if you're going to have Jon Stewart back on The Daily Show and Biden is making up words, he's going to bring it up. He's he, not He's not going to just only fucking simp for the Democrats. He's going to say some funny shit about anything that happens to Democrats, too. It's funny. It's part of what the show used to be. It's weird that there's a resp- There's like a social responsibility people attribute to comedians when it's like, Fuck. most of us got good at this by cursing at strangers in a bar. Yeah. I mean, we all have our political opinions, which is fine. But it's like what John's capable of is delivering the news in a very funny way. He's the best at it. He's the best at that role of being like the guy that's doing the satire of the news, you know, just breaking down everything that's wrong and fucking stupid in the world. He he is the peak. And it's interesting because he is like the animal house. He's like National Lampoon's Animal House of, he's like the bar. And then a lot, then everyone tries to copy Animal House, right? right. Then, and you end up with Porkies. a lot of like, Porkies, <laughs> Van Wilder 2, The Rise of Taj. <laughs> You're like, all right, this isn't as good. But Stuart, like if you actually look at his, his standup, like it's like any form of entertainment. To break these rules, you have to know the rules. And Stuart is a great standup. Yeah, he's a very funny guy. He had jokes he's I remember, like, guy. I remember he had a joke back in the day where it was about like uh, how Jews and black people are similar because, you know, Jews, you know, black people, we have the blues and Jews, we just complain all the time. <laughs> and we just never thought to put it to music. And I'm like, that's that's the type of observation that's like, that's like unifying. That's yeah. like bringing a room together. Yes. I love that. That's a very funny bit too. Yeah, he had, he had a, a great special in the 90s called Unleavened. I remember it. It was on Comedy Central all the time. Yeah, so he's back like on The Daily Show sometimes. Is that what it is? Mondays. Mondays. <laughs> he was like, I'll give you one day. That's a good move for him. Yeah, yeah why, why do it? I guess that he had a deal with Apple, and um, I don't know if they're saying the specifics of why they canceled the show, but it was something akin to they didn't want him to say anything that would get them in trouble. Something along those lines. I, I forget think what his quote maybe was. Maybe about China, and they're like, hey, we make a lot of shit over Here there. Here it is. Yeah. Here it is. Um, Apple, uh, John Stewart says, Apple TV canceled his show because they didn't want me to say things that might get me in trouble. <laughs> okay. Damn. Boy, kids, what kind of a world are we talking? And Apple. by the way, that's like, that's like what comics 
that's what gets us excited. The idea that this could get me in trouble. Like that, that's everything. Also, Apple, by the way, you d distribute all the apps that, that do all the trouble. That, and that's you take a percentage everybody too. in trouble. You take a percentage of their profits. The place. You, you don't want Jon Stewart to say something that might get him in trouble. Why don't you let him decide for himself? What's great about Jon Stewart too is like there's so many comics who are like, and I have no issue with this, but speak like recklessly. Uh, a, and is, John is so careful with his words yeah, and, and so skilled at it. Yeah. Um, I wanted a place to unload thoughts as we get into this ele election season, Stewart said. I thought I was going to do it over at They Call Apple TV+. Plus. It's a tele television enclave, very small. It's like living in Malibu. But they decided <laughs> they felt that they didn't want me to say things that might get me in trouble. Okay. I don't know what that means. Yeah. You know, that could mean a lot of things. Very coded. I think it's talking about... You know, I think China maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a stuff China, like that. There's something about that. that yeah. Apple did like Apple obviously works with China. Yeah. What was the su subject? Says it it has, says China. Maybe it's something AI in China. Okay, Times reported that the duo had disagreements over topics that were to be covered in the third season, including AI and China. Wow, they had a disagreement about AI and China. <laughs> These people, what are they doing? Members of the U.S. House of Rep Representatives later questions Apple CEO Tim Cook about whether the tech giant's decision to cancel Stewart's show is because the host may have been planning an upcoming episode about China. Uh, he says, while companies have the right to determine what content is appropriate for their streaming service, the coercive tactics of a foreign power should not be directly or indirectly influencing those determinations. The leaders of the House of Representatives Select Committee on Competition with the Chinese Communist Party wrote in a letter to Cook. Holy shit. While Stewart did not mention the rumors about Apple's alleged worry over an episode about China, he did say the tech giant did want me to say things that might, did not want, didn't want me to get, say things that might get me in trouble. As for his Daily Show return, he said he hopes to provide a catharsis to viewers this election season and a way to comment on things and a way to express them that hopefully people will enjoy. Huh. Hmm. Well, so far. That sounds like China said, don't fucking put that shit on. Yeah. That's what I got out it of that. So what did you get out of that, Sam? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I it's, like, it's like that <laughs> Seth Rogen movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with the North Korea, yeah. Is that one that's still available? Can you get that? I think so. Bro. Remember when there was like tension like are we gonna get nuked over a Seth Rogen movie? I remember watching that going like do you know how dangerous those people are? <laughs> do you know you want North Koreans mad at you for hee hees and ha ha's? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oof. And then they hacked the servers, right? Isn't that how that happened? Is that what happened? They with hacked the, the Was that Sony, right? Yeah. And then a bunch of shit got found out. Yeah. And emails oh. and was that definitely them? Was that I, that's what I was trying to remember. I, I that thought could so, just but be maybe cyber yeah, criminals. Been, I think it was yeah, it I don't, a coincidence. I don't it might have been a coincidence and it could be cyber criminals that decided to attack based on that. Oh, no, 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 no. According to the wiki, it says, uh, Can I just dream? <laughs> Can I boy dream? It was the them. Guardians of the Peace, a cyber crime group allegedly connected to North Korean government. Okay, it is con connected, huh? Yeah. Guardians of Peace, what a great name. That sounds like a, like a government bill. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. Guardians of Peace sounds like a new bill they would push in front of the House. <laughs> Man, some of the Senate, remember when the Senate did, they did a hearing on, uh, it was like, during Katrina, I think they did like one day on Katrina and nine days on steroids and baseball. Because <laughs> they just wanted, it was like, because you just want to meet <laughs> Raphael Palmero, remember? They're like, oh, we're big fans. Oh my God, that's hilarious. I mean, the, the shit that they get concerned with is so crazy. Yeah, but you don't want to go full communist. You don't right. want to say like the news shouldn't be able to make money. You know, they should be able to make money. They should be but, able to make money, but the second you combine news and entertainment, yeah, it gets it's real a dangerous squirrely. mucky area. It gets real squirrely. Because entertainment is... Is not news. It's not the news, news at is all. supposed to be boring. Boring as shit. You're supposed to be like, why yeah. am I watching? And now we have it in a way where, like, you watch 12 straight out of the news, that's a fucking problem. Well, what's my favorite is the in between story banter. That is the most <laughs> uncomfortable, hurried, kind of weird fake talk that exists in all of television. It doesn't exist anywhere else on earth right now in mainstream entertainment. And the, <laughs> the banter between the anchor and like the weather lady as they're throwing back and forth to each other, then this guy. Oh, right, dude. It is the fakest. Well, that. Seems like, uh, I don't know what to say I, about that. I still do morning news just to ruin the segments. <laughs> that's the only reason I go on. Yeah. I, I do it all the time. You did a good one in Columbus. <laughs> did you see that one? Yeah, it's that, from France. That was, that was what did one, you do? <laughs> I, I can send it to you. It's pretty funny. I, yeah, I'll find I, it. Yeah, it's, I, I think I have it here. It's, it's, uh, it's probably on my Instagram or something. It's, uh, I just kept making up that they had a human trafficking problem in Columbus, and the guy lost it on me. 
because I, I'll only do those news segments if they're live because there's no point in doing a tape one. They'll just edit out whatever horrible <laughs> thing I do. But, you know, sometimes you get someone really cool and you'll just riff with them and be silly. But this dude, I could tell, I'll like, I'll throw like a jab to see if it bothers them. And if I can sense it bothers them, I'll go like 100 miles an hour and just derail the segment. I got, <laughs> I got, I remember I have a, pub, I have a publicist, Pam, who hates me. She, I just, I'm like, I don't care about morning radio. Just book me on morning shows. Cause, and she's like, they're on to you. They know you're going to ruin the segment. <laughs> but Pam, uh, she gets so mad at me. But like, I, do you ever go on one and the people are cool and you don't ruin the segment? Yeah, totally. But they usually end up, sometimes they think it's funny. But other times, yeah, I did one, we were on a tour bus last year and I pretended my opener, Gary Veter, overdosed on cocaine on the bus and oh, they were so mad God. at me. And uh, and she called me like, you're banned from Good Morning Durham. And I was like, <laughs> I'll live. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, we've done a lot where I just, I, I, I poke and I see what I can get away with. How many people are watching those shows? Not a lot, but when I share them, they do pretty well because they're it's they're so- weird to watch me do something bad. Ha, that's amazing. That's wild. I don't even know why that still exists. Why do comedians even do that anymore? Can you just make an Instagram video? Like that's all Burt Kreischer does now. He just makes Instagram videos. But going on, this guy likes John Stewart a lot, you know. And you know, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. Me, not so much. But admittedly. When I was younger, I would watch The Daily Show all the time. I did not know that this guy was lulling me into this this kind of spell, making me laugh at things and laugh at things until he got you in a place where he could insert the agenda because that is what those guys do. Trevor Noah, Jon Stewart, John Oliver, Stephen Colbert, which is why they brought him on The Tonight Show, those guys are more propagandists than the peep, the talking heads you see on mainstream television. Why? Now, I'm just going to get into the crossfire stuff, but I just want to say, why do I say that? Well, think about this. CNN is CNN. And when you're just trying to hang out and chill, you're not going to watch CNN. But The Daily Show was on Comedy Central. It might still be. I have no idea. I don't watch TV anymore, but it was on Comedy Central. What are you doing when you're on Comedy Central? You're just chilling. You want to watch something funny. You're laughing. You're, you're more accepting of the things you're watching. Also, you're watching CNN. You're one age. You're watching Comedy Central. You're another age. There, it's, it's a big thing that they do. So they're inserting news agenda onto a channel where people who are watching Comedy Central don't really engage in mainstream news. They don't want to watch news. They want to watch comedy. And now all of a sudden, those same talking points, that same agenda is being pushed into you via laughter. Now, I'll get deeper into that in a second, but let's go into the whole, um, the crossfire. I have a couple of clips from here that I never got to see before. Usually we only see the one clip where Jon Stewart's going, please, please. And it seems like Tucker Carlson is flustered and he's getting punked off. But before that... Tucker Carlson is actually kind of grilling Jon Stewart. And he's asking him, why isn't he asking tougher questions when he's in front of certain political people, one of which at the time was John Kerry. Jon Stewart made it clear that he wanted Kerry to win the election. So when he had Kerry in front of him, he didn't ask any hard questions. Tucker Carlson calls this out. Let's listen to this. We do that. I'd like to see something valuable. Yeah, no, it's it's I would like to I would like to hear it. And I'll tell you, when politicians come on. Yeah. It's nice to get them to try and answer the question. And mm-hmm. in order to do that, we try and ask them pointed questions. I want to contrast our questions with some questions you asked John Kerry. If, if, you want to, if you want to compare your show to a comedy show, you're more than no, no, welcome but here's, to. No, no, here's, here's the point. If, if, Kerry that's, doesn't have, if that's your goal, no, it's not. I wouldn't aim for here's, us. I'd aim for Here's the problem. That's Kerry a very good show. Kerry won't come on this show. He will come on your show. Let me suggest right. why he wants well, to. Well, we have civilized discourse. Well, here, here, here's, here's an example of civilized discourse. Here are three of the questions you asked, John. Yeah. You have a chance to interview the Democratic nominee. You ask him mm-hmm. questions such as, quote, how are you holding up? Is it hard not to take the attacks personally? Yeah. Have you ever flip-flopped, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Didn't you feel like you got the chance to interview the guy? Why not ask him a real question instead of just suck up to him? Yeah, how are you holding up is, uh, is a real suck up. And uh, uh, I actually was giving him a hot stone massage. It sounded that way. As we were doing it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about I felt my responsibility to the, you know, I, I didn't realize that, and maybe this explains quite a bit, no, the opportunity is that the news organizations look to Comedy Central for their cues on integrity. So <laughs> right. um, no, no, what, what I would suggest is when you talk about you're holding politicians' feet to the fire, I think that's disingenuous. I think you're. How are you holding up? 
I mean, come on. You no, 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 no. I don't. But my come my on. role isn't. I don't. Well, you think. can ask him a real question, don't you think? Instead of saying, you know, I don't think I, I have. To. By the way, I, I also asked him, you know, where you in Cambodia, but I didn't really care, because <laughs> I don't care because I think <laughs> I it's tell. stupid. <laughs> well, but, but my my point is this. Mm -hmm. If your idea of uh, confronting me is that I don't ask hard-hitting enough news questions, we're in bad shape, fellas. We're here to love you, not confront well, you. No, 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 but, but what, what I'm saying is, is this. I, I'm not. I'm here to, to confront you because we need help from the media, and they're hurting us. And it's, yeah. the, the idea if is... They, if the indictment, like, let me get this straight, if the indictment yeah. is... Uh, if the indictment is, and I have seen you say this, that yeah. uh, Crossfire reduces everything, as I said in the intro, to right. left, right, black, white. Yes. Well, it's because, see, we're a debate show. It's like saying the no, Weather no, Channel no, no, no. reduces That'd be everything great. to a storm. I would love to see a debate show. 30 minutes in a 24-hour day where we have each side on as best no, we can No, no, get no, no, no. That would be great. And to, have them fight it out. To do a debate would be great, but that's like saying pro wrestling is uh, a show about <laughs> athletic I'm competition. Sorry. I, I think you're a good comedian. I think your lectures are boring. Let me ask you, let me yeah. ask you a question on the news. Now, this is theater. I mean, it's, it's it is, obvious. No, no, it is. How old are you? 35. And you wear a bow tie. Yeah, I do. I do. So, I do. so this is... No, no, I know, I know. So you're right. No, no, let me just go. No, come on. And come listen, on. I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that you're, that, not, you're not a smart guy, because those are not easy to tie. But the thing difficult. is that this, you're doing theater when you should be doing debate, which would be great. You do no, it's, it's, it's not, not honest. What you do is not honest. What you do is partisan honest. hackery. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you why I, I know it. You on your show, and you sniff his throne, and you're accusing us of partisan hackery? Absolutely. You're You've a, got to be kidding, man. You're on CNN. And you say. My, the show that leads into me is puppets making crank phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with you? I'm All right, I will. Now, now, here's the thing. I just brought this up. He's trying to have this cop out, and I got another clip in a second. I actually got one, two more clips from the crossfire. So this is actually Tucker. I never knew that this happened. I never got to see this. We always see a very short clip of Jon Stewart kind of saying, I'm not going to be your monkey, and Tucker Carlson not really knowing what to say, but we never really see this part, the personal insults towards the bow tie, him kind of copping out that he's a comedian, then also saying, you know, my show is, you know, I follow a show that's about, like, puppets making prank phone calls. That's true. And again, I bring this up to illustrate a point. The people who are watching that show, they're not all kids. I used to watch that show too. I think it was called like Crank Crank Callers or something like that. It was actually a funny show. It was like the Jerky Boys. Now, <laughs> when when I was watching that, I would be in a state of laughter. And this is a real thing. A lot of people may not want to take this in as real. This is a real thing. I would be in a state of laughter. When you're in a state of laughter, Joe Rogan talks about this often, you're almost... It's almost like akin to hypnosis. If I can make you laugh constantly, if I can have you in a state of laughter for 10 minutes, and then I ask you for something, you know, maybe it's something really small, you're probably more likely to say yes, you know, unless it's some wild thing that I'm asking for. But as we laugh with people, and guys know this, you guys know this when you're trying to date a girl, if you're making a girl laugh, she's more likely to like you because she has you associated with laughter, the chemicals that go off in your head. So when we have someone like Jon Stewart trying to cop out, trying to say, oh man, I'm just a comedian, but yeah, you're a comedian who gets to talk to a presidential candidate. Why wouldn't you ask some at least remotely tougher questions? Why would it just be this fest, this, this very soft fest where you get to parade this presidential candidate in front of the public and it's in front of a broad audience of people who otherwise didn't want to see a news show at all. And now they know about this presidential candidate. They know that he's the one running. They see that he's sitting with Jon Stewart, someone who's funny, who makes me laugh. That's all I know about the guy. Seems cool. Seems cool to me. He sat with Jon Stewart. They got along. And Jon Stewart always calls out the people in power who need to be called out. But he didn't call out that guy. That must be a good guy. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that's how everyone's mind works. I'm not saying you're susceptible to that point, but there are a lot of people who are, especially when you're sitting watching crank callers like me. And if you're anything like me, you're high out of your mind. You know what I mean? So it's just very interesting. It's a very interesting little, as you start to look at this a little deeper, because I didn't realize when I was younger that this guy was just like the talking heads in the media. 
but he's more than that. Because what, it, what comedians can do is something journalists can't. They can make you laugh. They can influence you. They are also actors. Jon Stewart is an actor. He's not just, you know what? Sorry. I'll get, I'll get into that in a second. <laughs> Let's play the next clip. You say there's no reason for you, when you have this marvelous opportunity not to be the guy's butt boy, to go ahead and be his butt boy. Yes, that no. That is embarrassing. I was absolutely his butt boy. I was so far, you would not believe what he ate two weeks ago. You know, the interesting thing that I have is you have a responsibility to the public discourse. And you, you fail need to get a job at a miserably. School, I think you need to go to one. The the thing that I want to say is, when you have people on for just knee jerk reactionary talk. Wait, I thought you were going to be funny. Come on, be funny. No, no, I'm not going to be your monkey. Um, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I watch your show every day, and it kills me. I can tell you, love it's it. It's so oh, it's so painful to watch. Um, you, you know. Because we need what you do. This is such a great opportunity you have here to actually get politicians really off Stewart? of their marketing anyway? and strategy. Yeah, it's someone who watches your show and cannot take it anymore. I just can't. What's it like to have dinner with you? It must I'm be just... excruciating. Do you like lecture people like this, or do you come over to their house and sit and lecture them? And, you know, they're not doing the right thing. That they're missing their opportunities, evading their responsibilities. If I think they are, look, I would want to eat with you, man. That's horrible. I know, and you won't. But the thing we I want to get to. We did promise to... naked pictures of the Supreme Yeah, we did. No. Let's get to those. Why which can't, in this book, why which can't is a we just talk? Book. Please, I beg of you guys. I please. think you watch too much Crossfire. We're going to take a quick No, break. no, no, no. Look, no, no, hold please. on. We've got, we've got commercials. I. Look, he's like pleading with them. Like, like again, this. look at this face. This is exactly what a journalist can't do. A journalist doesn't, they don't have the skill set to be like, please, please, I, I'm just one of the people and I can't take it anymore. We need your help, please. They don't have that skill set. They don't have the skill set of punchlines or misdirection or anything like that. They just don't do that. If you ask Matt Taibbi, hey, make this article funny, he'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. We're talking about the Nord Stream pipeline. Can I just put this story out? That'd be it. But hey, Matt, can you... Can you, can you spike your hair up a little bit? You mind wearing this wig and spiking your hair? He'd be like, no, what are you talking? I don't do that. But if you go to a guy like Jon Stewart, who was in Half Baked, who was an actor, comedian, and you say, hey, I need you to take this narrative and I need you to, to make it funny. And I need you to kind of tickle the left and I need you to slice the right. Can you do that for us, Jon? Of course he can. And he can do it masterfully. masterfully. Everybody knows Jon Stewart, like and whether you like him or not. I don't. But as a stand-up, like I know stand-up, he's great. He's a great stand-up comedian. And when you're a great stand-up comedian, you're really masterful at doing things like monologues. I mean, think of like George Carlin. I'm not comparing the two, but like think of George Carlin. If George Carlin sat down like Tucker Carlson and did a monologue, you'd be like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. He always wanted to do stand-up. But if George Carlin had a podcast, you'd be like, I'm listening to everything he has to say. There, He'd be the biggest podcast in the world right now if he had a podcast. Because he was so good at punching things up, making things funny, throwing you this way, throwing you that way, making you think he's coming at this, coming at that, and then boom, all of a sudden something hilarious happens. Journalists can't do that. That's why guys like this are more dangerous. Now, we got a third clip. We got a third clip from Crossfire. This is the last clip. I believe this is the last clip. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, this is the last clip here. And then we have one more where... Uh, John Stewart decides to just insult Tucker because he's mad. Our moral inferiority. John, you're bumming us out. Tell us, what do you think of the Bill O'Reilly vibrator story? No. I'm sorry? I don't. Oh, okay. What, what do you think? Uh, let me change the subject then. Uh, Where's your moral which, outrage on this? <laughs> I don't have any. Uh, I which, know. Which candidate do you suppose would provide you better material? I'm sorry? Which candidate do you suppose would provide you better material if he won? Mr. T. I think he'd be the funniest. Uh, well, I don't... Do you have a stake in it that way, as a, not just a citizen, but as a professional comic? Right, which I you hold have... to be much more important than a, as a citizen. Well, there you go. Uh, well, who would provide you better material if it's supposed to? I, I don't really know. I, it's kind of not how we look at it. We look at the, the absurdity of the system provides us the most material, and that is best served by sort of the, uh, the theater of it all, you know, which, by the way, Thank you both, because it's been helpful. <laughs> but if, but if, if Kerry gets elected, is it good? I mean, you said you're voting for him. You obviously support him. It's uh, mm -hmm. clear. Will it be harder for you to mock his administration if he becomes president? Now, why would it be harder? Because the support, only way it would uh, be harder is if his administration is less absurd than this one. So in that case, if it's less absurd, then yeah, I think it'd be harder. But uh, I mean, it'd be hard to top this group. I mean, quite frankly. <laughs> 
uh, in terms of absurdity and their world uh, matching up uh, to, to, to the one that, you know, it was interesting, I, I, President Bush was saying, you know, John Kerry, his rhetoric doesn't match his record, but I've heard President Bush describe his record, his record doesn't match his record. So, you know, I don't, I don't worry about it in that respect. But let me ask uh, uh, you guys again a question, because we talked a little bit about, you know, you're actually doing honest debate and all that. But after the debates, where do you guys head to right afterwards? The men's room. Be, right after that. Right, home. Spin Alley. Home? No, Spin Alley. What are you talking about? You mean at these debates? Yeah, you go to Spin Alley, the place called Spin Alley. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you think that for people watching at home, that's kind of a drag, that you're literally walking to a place called Deception Lane? Like, it's <laughs> Spin Alley. It's, don't, don't you see, that's the, the issue I'm trying to talk to you guys. Well, I actually believe, I had a lot of friends who worked for President Bush. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to college with Neither somewhere. of us was ever in the Spin Room, actually. They, no, I did. I went to Larry King's room. They actually believe right. what they're saying. They want to persuade you. That's what they're trying to do by spinning. But I don't doubt for a minute these people who work for President Bush, who I disagree with and everything, they right. believe that stuff, John. This is Here, not here's a lie or deception at all. I think they, they believe, believe in him. I think they believe, Just like I believe in my guys. I think they believe President Bush would do a better job and I believe the Kerry guys believe President Kerry would do a better job, but what I believe is they're not making honest arguments. So what they're doing is, in their mind, the ends justify the means. I, 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 so, I, I do think you're more fun on that. Now, if you notice, he said the Bush guys and he said the Kerry guys. He keeps trying to position himself like he's in the center, when in reality, he was a full supporter of Kerry. He's a full supporter of Kerry, interviewed Kerry, gave him softball questions, tried to paint him in a very good light, and that's all well and good. But take this channel, for example. I When I do a Trump video, I wear a Trump shirt. And if I don't have it on, it's close by, believe me. And I even say, hey, guys, you know my bias? I love Trump. I think he's great. I think he's fantastic. I always try to do that. I do a video about Israel. I say, hey, listen, guys, I know I have a lot of Jewish friends and I got a bias in this. I always talk about my biases. John tries to disguise his biases. He tries to show you that he's just like you, which is why he positioned himself as a citizen. He's like, oh, for the citizens. You notice how he said Tucker and that gentleman have a, a responsibility. And he was kind of alluding to the fact that he doesn't have a responsibility because he's a comedian. But he's doing the same thing. He's showing you the news the exact same way. But he's saying he doesn't have a responsibility, and these guys do. Now, here's my last uh, little tidbit. I just want to show you this really quick. I just thought it was funny. Here. On your show. Uh, just my opinion. But can, can okay, just, Zach, John Stewart goes one-on-one you know on one with his note? fans. You're as big a dick on your show question. as you are on any show. <laughs> He ends up calling him a dick. <laughs> it's really interesting. He just decides to call him a dick. He gets really upset because Tucker's like, okay, we got to go. Like, I don't understand all this grandstanding. But here's the thing. And, of course, in my bias of this, I mean, I, li I like Tucker Carlson a lot. I think he's doing a incredible job right now. And I think Jon Stewart is doing a disservice with what he has the ability to do currently because he's told he's doing this for the administration right now what you see him doing there's it's no it's no coincidence that just as the election is ramping up that he has now taken his seat back at the daily show there's no coincidence in that whatsoever no coincidence that he has the same talking points as cnn no coincidence now um the last thing that I wanted to bring up. Oh, I should actually tell you guys this. He brought up Spin Alley. Just so you know what Spin Alley is, because a lot of people don't. I know I didn't. Uh, Spin Alley is a room. Uh, it's a spin room. It's where reporters uh, can speak with uh, debate uh, participants and representatives after the debate. Um, it's somewhere where they all just get together. And it's said where they have one goal all together. Here it is right there. One goal to sell a narrative. So they all get together after. And they kind of try to have a narrative. Now, I don't really understand how this works, I'll be honest with you. Because when you're a talking head, like Anderson Cooper does a show, there's no reason for him to run to the spin room. They've already handled the spin in the teleprompter in his script. So I don't really see why he's so upset about that. I could understand maybe if you're going to the spin room, the debate's not over, everybody comes back with a different narrative and all of a sudden this guy's gonna win the debate, this guy's not gonna win the debate. Then I could see it, but how he positioned it, he's like, where do you guys go after the show is done? And Tucker said they don't go to the spin room. One gentleman actually admitted that he has gone to a spin room when he was on Larry King. So, I don't know, just something that John brought up. It was interesting. Um, but we're gonna move on 
John Stewart. What else did I have written down here? Yeah, just the uh, comedy cop out media hurting talking about the media. Uh, he's being hurt by the, the media currently. He needs help. It's very, very interesting. But here's the last thing that I'll bring up when it comes to Crossfire. Now, Crossfire wasn't the best show. Should there be a new version of the Crossfire? Yes. Is it breaking points with Crystal Ball? Absolutely not. There should be a different show where someone from the left and the right sit down. Why? Because nowadays, if you go to a protest that is severely right wing, not even right wing, not even right wing. Usually you see it left wing. You go to an LGBTQ type of rally, you know, pro-life or sorry, pro-choice. You go to any of these and you have somebody who's on the opposite side of things and they go around trying to talk to people. What, is it, what ends up happening to that person? They get shouted down. People walk up with umbrellas, put the umbrellas in their face. Sometimes they have air horns they'll blow air horns at them. Sometimes they'll just get straight up assaulted all the time. It's it's pretty crazy. What I don't understand is even if it was not a rough debate, like a real hardcore debate that Tucker and this gentleman would have. Why would Jon Stewart, and this is why I say he's a tool of the establishment, why would he have a problem with someone from the left and someone from the right painting these issues and topics as left and right, hashing it out, bumping heads together, leaving no hard feelings, coming back the next week or the next day, however, however often that show was on, and then having it out again, showing people, showing the public that you can have civil discourse with someone who is on the left or someone who is on the right. You can disagree with them. You do. You may not even find common ground. That's okay. You can leave, cool off, come back another time and discuss things again. That is a great thing to be showing people. But for some reason, John actually had a problem with that. The reason he had a problem with that is because Tucker Carlson has always been hated. Not always, but for a very long time, he's been a hated type of uh, personality by the the mainstream. Even though he was mainstream, he was also he would also get hate a lot. The fact that John Stewart had a, a problem with that type of show just shows that he's operating for the establishment. Why is that a problem? That's a good thing for people to see. It's a good thing for people to see that you can have debate and be fine. You can have this civil back and forth. It can even be your friend because they were actually very friendly, him and that gentleman. Sorry, I don't know his name. So that was just my first like light bulb. I was like, oh, why is John even afraid of Why is John not like this? Why is he saying that this is a problem? He was actually suggesting that they shouldn't be arguing. He was actually suggesting that they should just be having people on and asking harder questions. And then Tucker was just positioning it the same way. Like, you have people on. Why don't you ask harder questions? And John was like, well, I'm a comedian. It was absolute nonsensical. But that was Tucker Carlson getting destroyed. I'll let you decide from what you saw if that's actually what happened. I don't really think so. I used to think so because I only saw that little part of it. But now that I've watched the whole thing, I'm like, mm, not really. They kind of just went back and forth. And they annoyed each other, obviously. Now, this is Tucker Carlson years later responding to Jon Stewart. This 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 beef runs deep. This is like Tupac and Biggie right here. <laughs> I didn't debate Jon Stewart the first time. He came on our show and made a bunch of noises that I didn't understand then. I don't understand now. I think he's a talented guy, uh, more talented than I am and been more successful than I am. But I still don't understand what point he was trying to make. I thought it was ridiculous. And if you go back and look at the tape, I haven't, but I remember it pretty well. Um, I don't think he said anything intelligible or worth hearing. You know, you're bad for America. Okay. Um, you suck up to politicians. Well, that's, that's about the only sin I've never committed. I mean, the one thing I've never done is sniff the throne of someone in power. I just, I find that repulsive. I've never done it. Um, he has. He would have politicians on his show and, you know, if he agreed with them, John Kerry, for example, Barack Obama, right before the presidential elections in 04 and 08, he would ask them, you know, why are you so wonderful? Is it hard that people are so mean to you? I mean, I, I felt like he had an obligation to ask a little tougher questions. Um, I may have asked questions that were too nasty. You know, that's probably a fair criticism, but I've certainly never sucked up to anybody. So I didn't even understand his criticism then. I get that he was more popular than I was and probably still is much more popular than I am. And so he was recorded as the winner, but on the merits, you know, what he had to say was dumb. <laughs> Tucker, 
Tucker, I love Tucker, but that you, you can tell he's still a little bitter about that. Nobody likes that. You know, Tucker Carlson brings up the fact that that was one of the first big viral clips on YouTube, period. One of the first, which had to be a big shock. He talks about it a little bit in a, in a clip that I'm going to show you, but he uh, actually, I don't even think I have that part, but he brings up the fact that it was kind of a shock and it was there forever. And people kind of determined John to be the winner because John was more popular. And it's just funny how tables have turned so much. Now, Tucker Carlson and Jimmy Dore sat down. And again, if you're an avid watcher of this channel, thank you so much. But you may have seen this clip already if you've been watching every single video. But I have to show it again just for context in the whole back and forth that they've been having. This is Jimmy Dore. Giant balls of steel on Jimmy Dore. He decides while he's interviewing Tucker Carlson, let me show you a clip of Jon Stewart and you going back and forth. And then they kind of just... Uh, they talk about John Stewart and Tucker Carlson talks about what he really thinks about John Stewart. So let's go. So that, that was go ahead. Kurt. Do you know, what I realized what John was arguing against because I remember when that came out, what he's arguing against is like, no, it, you, it's not productive because you guys are, aren't like uh, you shouldn't be arguing at all. We should all just be united <laughs> saying the, the handed propaganda without even the illusion of an argument. That's right. So what what happened to you? You went from there. You made atonement for the Iraq war, and then they took your advertisers away, and you started to tell the truth about everything. The Syrian war, Ukraine war, COVID, vaccines, everything. You started to be the only person in news to tell the truth about the biggest stories of our time. And Jon Stewart went on to hang a medal on a <laughs> Nazi at Disney World in service of the war machine. And he'll never apologize for it. And he'll never even he'll never even acknowledge that he did it. Just go, hey, I got tricked or something. So he won't even say that because he won't tell people the truth about the Ukraine war, because for a second, he told the people the truth about where the virus, the covid virus came from, which was a lab in Wuhan. He told the truth on Stephen Colbert's show. And then he was ostracized from polite society for over a year. And it it was it damaged him. It damaged him so much that he was willing to hang a medal on a Nazi at Disney World. The guy covered it up, though. He and didn't that, know it's a lab there it is. See, so put a red thing on. <laughs> and then and then he had to go give a tongue bath to two of the most bloodthirsty warmongers in the history of our country, Hillary Clinton and Condi Rice. And then when he did cover COVID in the vaccine, he didn't bring on Dr. Robert Malone or McCullough or Pierre Corey or anybody who had a counter narrative to the establishment lies. He brought on three liars for the establishment and pretended like he was. Co so he did propaganda for big pharma and the establishment, not only for wars. He's doing it currently. And he's not only put for vaccines, but for covid, for everything. And meanwhile, there you are going to visit Julian Assange at Belmarsh. And here you are bringing on Doc, uh, RFK Jr. to tell the truth about Big Pharma. So it, what a complete different arc between Jon Stewart and you. He became a yes man to the establishment who's lying to his or lying to his audience and afraid to tell the truth. He'll never tell his audience the truth about Ukraine. He'll never tell his audience the truth about COVID or lockdowns or he'll never do that. And uh, he'll never tell when is where's is he on the front lines of trying to get Julian Assange out of prison? I don't know. Is he? I don't think so. So I just want to get your reaction to that kind of crazy arc that Jon Stewart had this pompous moral high ground when he came on CNN. And now he's turned into the piece of shit that I make fun of and debunk on a daily basis. He should wear a bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> so I always thought, well, let me just say it's interesting. I hadn't seen that clip well since it happened because I never watched clips of myself. So it's been almost 20 years. Um, I should say, when that aired, I had already come out and atoned for supporting the Iraq war. Um, and he had a different view. He's always been a neocon, like always. Um, he's never changed. He's been consistent on that, I will say. But he looks a little less appealing than I thought. I mean, he he was a preachy little phony, really, from the very beginning. He has talent. I always thought he was pretty funny, actually. He's pretty fast. I mean, I'm sure you guys know him well. He's got a lot of he's talent. He's fast. So there's that. Yeah, he does. He has talent for sure. Um, but he was always hollow inside, didn't really believe anything. His his beliefs actually just amounted to self-hatred and guilt. That's not a belief system. Those aren't principles. Those are impulses. And um, so I'm not really surprised that he has become 
you know, another Praetorian guard for the establishment because that's kind of what he's always been in a way. Like he would he would do the sort of normal shit they do, like, you know, ra- they love the race stuff. You're a racist. So and so's a race. Everything's about race. It's just not that interesting a topic. In my opinion, I've never been very interested in race. It doesn't go anywhere, but he's obsessed with that topic. And in some ways, in retrospect, that's the easiest topic. Everyone's like, oh, it's the hardest topic. No, it's the easiest topic. Because you, you don't have a conversation. It's just posturing. Nothing ever changes. No one's life has improved. No one actually gets better. No one's improved at all. But the person doing the hectoring gets to feel superior. And he's that's kind of been his bread and butter for, for the 25 years. I knew him when he came on. I mean, I'd known him for a while. So for the 25 years I've known him, that's kind of – that's been the sum total of his moral universe. Like you're a racist, I'm not. And um, so it's really not surprising that he's wound up sucking up to Condi Rice or, you know, Hillary Clinton or some other totally indefensible warmonger creep. I'm not surprised at all. You don't think it's useful for him to ask the former first lady such hard hitting questions like what's it like to be a powerful woman? You don't think that's very you don't think that's <laughs> <laughs> but again, 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 that's so we're getting back to the race and gender thing and like race and gender are real and there are differences between the races and the genders or whatever, but they're not actually that it, it's not that first of all, it's not that interesting. It's not the most important thing and it doesn't go anywhere. So, but that's always where they go. All of these people, they did it with me for years. Once they couldn't cancel my show by pulling the advertising, then I became a white supremacist and a Nazi and a racist and at some point, I remember thinking to myself in the shower, I don't know, am I a racist? Like, no, <laughs> not actually. And then I just kind of didn't care after that. But they didn't stop because that's sort of all they had. They didn't want to like actually debate whether the Syrian gas attacks came from Assad or whether they even existed. They did not want to have that conversation. They don't want to talk about anything of substance at all. They just want to dismiss you as crazy or a bigot. And um, that's the world that Stewart has lived in for the decades I've known him, I will say. I think his next big move has got to be that he actually becomes a powerful woman. There just aren't any more chess moves left on the board. Am I right? (laughs) (laughs) Jimmy's a beast. Jimmy is a beast. It's crazy. You know, I've been uh, mulling over how I was going to release the interview with Jimmy because he just goes off on so many things and... You know, no matter what, when this is your main income, you're like, there is a fear. You're like, oh, man, he said all this stuff. But I think I just got to release it just in 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 total, in general, and just put it out there because we did it. We met. We did it via Zoom. And uh, it was pretty great. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I couldn't hand. I'm not ready for Jimmy Dore. He was like a whirlwind and i couldn't reel him i'm no joe rogan i couldn't i had like 15 questions i got to ask him maybe four he just goes it was crazy but sorry let's focus in um let's focus in we just heard all of that from john stewart or sorry from tucker carlson now right and i and i think tucker acts like he doesn't hear anything john stewart says and john stewart sits back and acts like he doesn't hear anything that tucker says i think they both hear everything that they're saying about each other because Jon Stewart went hard, okay? I don't like Jon Stewart, but he made a 20-minute video about Tucker Carlson and him interviewing Vladimir Putin. 20-minute video, pretty much an expose, picking apart Tucker Carlson. Now, I'm going to play this, and then I'm going to play a clip from CNN, and I just want to show you the fact that this guy, why does somebody who is supposed to be the the middle finger for all of us, the middle finger to the establishment, why does he have the same talking points as CNN? The exact same. Let's go. Here's why we're doing it. First, because it's our job. We're in journalism. Lie about what your job is. <laughs> we're in journalism. Our duty is to inform people. Lie about what your duty is. Americans have a right to know all they can about a war they're implicated in. Freedom of speech is our birthright. We were born with the right to say what we believe. Oh, shit. (laughs) Kudos, sensei. That was deep. I have much to learn. Disguise your deception and capitulation to power as noble and moral. 
and based in freedom. Yes, master. Uh, just out of curiosity. Uh... So, just wanted to play that part for you. Okay, and now you're like, what do you mean he has the same talking points as CNN? Remember what he just said and the clips that he just played, even the same clip. Listen to this. We're here to interview the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. Tucker Carlson is lying from the streets of Russia, no less. Not a single Western journalist has bothered to interview the president of the other country involved in this conflict, Vladimir Putin. That's a lie. Serious news outlets, including CNN, have requested Putin to interview over and over again. Most Americans have no idea why Putin invaded Ukraine or what his goals are now. They've never heard his voice. Another lie. Serious news outlets, including CNN, have covered and, of course, reported on Putin's words since this war began, including one of his baseless justifications for the invasion of Ukraine, which he initially claimed was to stop the Nazis. First, because it's our job. We're in journalism. Tucker Carlson is not a journalist, not even close. And not even close. <laughs> Why does John have the same talking points as this CNN person? They use the same part, everything. Be wary of people who speak in unison. Always be wary of people that speak in unison. It is crazy that John has the exact same talking points as CNN and as all the mainstream media. And I only say that to position my argument that he is a tool for the establishment. He really is, and he's one of the most dangerous. Again, his his show, and watch it, it's tickle, they just tickle the left, and they slice the right. They just poke fun at Biden, and they stab at Trump. That's exactly what they do throughout their whole show, and that's what he's always done. It was harder to see in the times of crossfire when he was doing that with Tucker Carlson because he was making fun of George Bush and everybody loved making fun of George Bush. Everybody loved jokes about George Bush. Everybody was talking about what a terrible president George Bush was. So when, when John was doing it then, it made perfect sense. But now that we have X and we have, we have YouTube and we have independent voices and we have people who are funnier than Jon Stewart doing their thing on YouTube, we have people who have more followers, more subscribers, all, we have more access now. Now you can look at someone like this, someone like this, and you can see that this guy is just, he's the same as Anderson Cooper. The only difference is he's a hundred times funnier. That's it. That's the only difference. And he doesn't have as much money because Anderson Cooper's a Vanderbilt, in case he didn't know. <laughs> I always like to bring that up. Now, we're going to move on. Okay, let's move on here. Well, actually, no, we're not going to move on. Let's let's play this clip from uh, Jon Stewart. He goes a little deeper. Now he really stabs at Tucker Carlson. Here's the reality. You f***ing know all this because you aren't as dumb as your face would have us believe. <laughs> Perhaps if your handlers had allowed, you would have seen there is a hidden fee to your cheap groceries and orderly streets. Ask Alexei Navalny or any of his supporters. In Vladimir Putin's Russia, political repression is everywhere. And hundreds have been arrested for daring to honor Navalny so publicly. Right. Because the difference between our urinal caked chaotic subways and your candelabra beautiful subways is the literal price of freedom. But the goal that Carlson and his ilk are pushing is that there's really no difference between our systems. In fact, theirs might be a little bit better. The question is, why? Why is Tucker doing this? Here's why. It's because the old civilizational battle was communism versus capitalism. That's what drove the world since World War II. Russia was the enemy then. But now they think the battle is woke versus unwoke. And in that fight, Putin is an ally to the right. He's their friend. Unfortunately, he is also a brutal and ruthless dictator. So now they have to make Americans a little more comfortable with that. I mean, liberty is nice, but have you seen Russia's shopping carts? <laughs> and Tucker would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those meddling assassins. 
In a statement to the New York Times, Carlson said, quote, it is horrifying what happened to Navalny. The whole thing is barbaric and awful. No decent person would defend it. Correct. No decent person would. For more on... To, oh, please enjoy your thought. For more on... Please, please, no, clap, clap, of course. And here's the thing, and, and I'm going to actually let Tucker explain this. That is why I have more clips of Tucker talking with Lex Friedman. Um, Tucker does explain what he actually meant when he was talking about the Russian system, when he was in the grocery store and all that stuff. He explains it a little more. But here's the thing. What Jon Stewart just did is he positioned it as woke versus unwoke. And we all know what that is. That is left versus right. And he's saying if you are right, you are aligned with Putin. That's what he's trying to pull off right now. And that if you want the clean streets that you saw uh, in the Tucker video, if you want the clean streets and the clean subways, well, what you're really asking for is a dictatorship. And you have to understand that the chaos that you see with the looters and people going crazy in the streets and the lawlessness and the open borders, well, that's freedom that you're seeing. And if you want anything other than that well then you're a putin you're aligned with putin you're a putin apologist you're a communist look at that those are the things that he does only a comedian could do this only a comedian could do this this well ah uh, ah uh. anyways guys let's move on let's move on to uh I can't, I can't i can't push that point enough that he's trying to align american citizens wanting clean streets order and secure borders as being aligned with Putin. Not 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 only is it right wing, but you're also aligned with Putin now. Beautiful. It's cuz Nazi got stale. That's why the word Nazi got too stale. Can't call black people Nazis, but you can you can say that they're aligned with Putin. But it's funny, again, the only reason I'm going to show this really quick is because these talking points kind of align with mainstream media. Now interviewing Vladimir Putin. Right. The first American, I'll say, journalist uh, to interview Putin since the war in Ukraine mm -hmm. began. What does that tell you about Tucker Carlson and right-wing media and also Vladimir Putin? Well, it shows me what I think we've all known. He's what's called a useful idiot. I mean, if you actually read translations of what's being said on Russian media, they make fun of him. So I just wanted to play that really quickly because not what Hillary said, well, also what Hillary said, because John is trying to liken Tucker to being an idiot as well for suggesting that there should be clean streets and whatnot. But they made sure to align Tucker the same way John did. What do you have to say about Tucker Carlson, right wing media and Vladimir Putin trying to align them all, trying to make them all the same thing? They go right hand in hand, all of these things. <sighs> it's a dirty game. It's a dirty game. You got to dissect it. Now we're gonna play. Uh, we're gonna play Tucker Carlson responding to John Stewart once again. Uh, let's play it from here. I got one Tucker Carlson clip. It's gonna run a little long. It's like a six-minute clip, and then I got one more after that. Let's get into this one. But John Stewart, like yeah. you know, if if he, there are a lot of things you could say about me, but he's much more partisan than I am. So to call me a partisan is like what? He would probably say that he's not a partisan that he's a comedian who's looking for the humor and the absurdity of the system. That's a dodge. On both sides. He's a dead serious, he's a very serious person in this, I will say this, and he shares this quality with a lot of comedians. I know a lot of comedians. I know a cross section of people just having done this job for a long time. And uh, a lot of them are very serious, like about their views and they they have a lot of emotional intensity. And he certainly is in that category. He's not, that's, that's like the silliest thing. Yeah, he's a comedian for sure. He can be very funny for sure. He has talent, no doubt about it. I've never denied that. But he is a he's motivated by um by his moral views. You know, this is right, that is wrong. And and I just think that's it's a misapplied passion. But do you think I'm just a comedian? Is um I don't think any serious person thinks that. I mean, if you're just a comedian, be and and I Look, I'm I, I'm not trying to claim I couldn't claim that I haven't said a lot of dumb things, and one of the dumbest things I ever said was when he was on our set lecturing me. You know, he's he's a moralizer, which I also just don't really care for as an aesthetic matter. But he um, he was lecturing me about something, and I said I thought you were here to tell jokes, which I shouldn't have said 
because he wasn't there to tell jokes. He was there to to lecture me and I should have just engaged it directly rather than trying to diminish him by like, you're just a little comedian. Well, he doesn't see himself that way. But I would just say this, John Stewart's a defender of power. Like John Stewart has never criticized, like what's John Stewart's view on you know, the aid we've sent to Ukraine, the $100 billion or whatever, like what happened to that money? What happened to the weapons that it bought? He doesn't care. He has the exact same priorities as the people permanently in charge in Washington. So whatever, he does, he's not alone in that. So does Mika Brzezinski and her husband and all the rest of the cast of dummies. But if you're gonna pretend to be the guy who's giving the finger to entrench power, you should do it once in a while. And he never has. There's not one time when he said something that would be deeply unpopular on Morning Joe. That's all I'm saying. And so don't call yourself a truth teller. You're, you're a court comedian or a, what, a flatterer of power. Okay, that's fine. There's a role for that, but don't pretend to be something else. I'll just be honest that I watched it just recently, that video. And from I 20 years ago? From 20 years ago. I watched it initially, and I remember very differently. I remembered that Jon Stewart completely destroyed you in yeah. that conversation and I watched it and you asked a very good question of him, which was, and you, there was no destruction, first of all, uh, and you asked a very good question of him. Why, when you got a chance to interview John Kerry, did you ask a bunch of softball questions? Yeah. I thought that was a really fair question. And then his defense was, well, I'm just a comedian. So I thought that was disingenuous. And I haven't watched it. I never have watched that clip one time in my life. And um, I don't like to watch myself on television. I never have. So that, and that's my fault. And I probably should force myself to watch it though. Of course I never will. But I, um, I think the takeaway for me, which was really interesting and life-changing was, I agree with your assessment. I'm not just I've lost a lot of debates. I've been humiliated on television. I'm not above that. It certainly happened to me. It will happen again. But I didn't feel like it was a clear win for him at all. You know, maybe a TKO, but it was not a knockout at all. And yet it was recorded that way. And I remember thinking, well, that's kind of weird. That's not what I remember. And then I realized, no, Jon Stewart was more popular than I was. Therefore, he was recorded as the winner. And that was hard for me to accept because that struck me as unfair. You should rate any contest on points. Like, here are the rules. We're going to judge the contest on the basis of those rules. And no, in the end, it's just like the more popular guy wins. Every TV critic like Jon Stewart, every one of them hated me. Therefore, he won. And I was like, wow, that, I guess I have to accept that reality. And you do, like the reality of the sunrise. You just have, you know, you're not in charge of it. So that's just what it is. Unfortunately, it's a bit darker. I think the reason he's seen as the winner and the reason at the time I saw as the quote unquote winner is because he was basically shitting on you, like personal attacks versus engaging yeah. ideas. And it was it was funny in a dark way and like making fun of the bow tie and all this kind of stuff. And like, fair. Bow tie. <laughs> I understand. And, and it was well, fair to call me a dick. I remember he called me a dick. And I remember even when he said that, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely a dick. Yeah, and that's he, not my best quality, trust me. I I, but also to be kind of, I thought Jon Stewart came off as a giant dick at that time, and I'm a big fan of his, and I think he has improved a lot. So that may we be should, true. We, I, should, we should also say that like we, people grow. <laughs> people I, well, like- well, I certainly have or change. Anyway, you hope it's growth. You hope it's not shrinkage, but- um, <laughs> But- It is so, cold outside. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean, look, I I- I haven't followed Jon Stewart's um, career at all. I don't have a television. Like I'm pretty cut off from all that stuff. But uh, so I wouldn't really know. But the measure to me is, are you taking positions that are unpopular with the most powerful people in the world? And how often are you doing it? It's super simple, not for its own sake, but do you feel free enough to say, you know, to the consensus, I disagree. And if you don't, then you're just another toady. That's my view. Well, I think he probably feels free enough to do it, but you're saying he doesn't do it. On the big Never does it. Never. Never once. Hillary Clinton interview, what do you think he asked her? Think he asked her about emails? No, of course not. <laughs> Condoleezza Rice, what do you think he asked her? Huh? Per person of color questions, you know what I mean? It's tough being a black woman, right? Blah, 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 all that stuff. It, it, very uh, Man, and... Kudos to Lex. Lex is always, you know, willing to speak up, willing to have these long, drawn out conversations to really understand people. And then also big fan of big fan. I'm not a fan of Stuart, like I have said, but he is. And he's willing to say, you know, I thought he came off as a big dick and he really did. He really did. 
Because again, when you are sent in as an attack dog, and you've seen this many times, I'm sure you've seen it many times in the mainstream media. When you're sent in as an attack dog, that's what you do. And you're like, why would they do it so viciously? It's like, cause there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's known about them that they don't e they either don't want to get out or they have their career riding on it. It's their money, it's their mortgage, it's their children, it's their life. They're not gonna, they're not going to lose any any type of ground. So even when it seemed like it was just a simple back and forth, he made he made this just like Lex said, he made sure to do personal attacks. He made sure to insult the boy bow, uh, bow tie. He made sure to call him a dick on national television. It's completely unprofessional, but then he has the cop out. I'm just a comedian. <laughs> you know how it is. You know how it is. Comedians just, we get wild sometimes. That's all. Man, dangerous. Very, very dangerous. We're going to go to this last clip where Tucker Carlson, again, Tucker Carlson, very, very nice as he talks about these things. You know, it's a little jabby, but it's, he tries to be very nice about it. But at the same time, he brings him up again. Lex doesn't even ask him about Jon Stewart this time. He brings him up again on his own, but for a very valid reason. Let's play that. Okay, right. It's just like so dumb. I, but no, of course they don't have, free, no country has freedom of speech other than us. Canada doesn't have it. Great Britain definitely doesn't have it. France, Netherlands, these are countries I spend a lot of time in. And Russia certainly doesn't have it. So that's why I don't live there. I'm just saying our sanctions don't work. That's all I was saying. And we don't have to live like animals. We can live with dignity. Even the Russians can do it. That's kind of what I was saying. Even the Russians under Vladimir freaking Putin can live like this. And no, it's not a feature of dictatorship. That's the most, I think, discouraging and most dishonest line by people like Jon Stewart, who really are trying to prepare the population for accepting a lot less. He is really a tool of the regime in a sinister way, always has been. Um, like, how dare you expect that? What are you, a Stalinist? It's like, no, I'm an American. I'm like a decent person. I just want to be able to walk to the grocery store without being murdered. Is that too much? To Shut up that you don't believe in freedom. It's really dark if you think about it, you know? So there is a fundamental way which you wanted. So you just brought him up real quick, but I do think that's very valid to say because that is what they're doing. When they position it like, I can't believe you're asking for more, you're already so privileged. Oh, if you're white in America, oh my God, you're, you basically live in heaven. You're living on the backs of all the people of color and the women around you. You don't have a right to complain. And if you're black, it's like, shh, 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 shh. let us think for you. You do not need to be thinking so much. Relax, relax. Why do you even have a job? Hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We got programs for you. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Now, I just wanted to play that whole thing for you guys because I woke up to it. You know, I always knew Jon Stewart was okay. He was whatever. But after seeing the whole exchange and seeing things in a different light, I was like, oh, this guy is a tool of the establishment. He is. He is one of those talking heads. And he is one of the most dangerous ones. You know, dangerous. I don't mean like, you know, he's not going to. He's not doing anything to your kids or anything, you know, but but it is he's doing things that journalists can't do. He's doing something way more. You look at Anderson Cooper and you're like, oh, propagandist, blah, blah, blah. He's doing something way worse than what Anderson Cooper does, because Anderson Cooper ain't funny for a second. You know what I mean? All of those guys, MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, she's not funny even for a little bit. None of them are. The View. But Jon Stewart. He could be arguably hilarious with what he does, masterful with the way he, he picks things apart. And as he does that, you have to see that he is actually lulling you into a position where you will accept the agenda. And those guys who use the comedy and do that type of thing on Comedy Central and all these shows, that's exactly what they're doing. And I just wanted to say that. Otherwise, guys, I'm out. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And this shirt, Cancel Hollywood, will be out in the next 24 hours. I'm out.